What is the structure of my talk? I will first talk about what my connection, my academic connections with the pandemic are or have been. Then I will tell, talk a little bit about what is the toolbox of sociology, the analytical toolbox and what questions arise from that toolbox. Among these, I will focus on especially two, namely social inequalities and much shorter the life course and a little bit on family schools and workplaces. What are my, what are my own contagions with the pandemic? Uh, the first one was uh, I was a member of the uh, working group of the National Academy of Sciences Leopoldina in Germany uh, and who made a recommendation. It was a third recommendation in spring, published in April 13th. And it was the first one where not only virologists and medical people had a say, but also uh, social scientists, psychologists, and, and uh, uh, economists. And actually, it was on that basis uh, which uh, our Chancellor Merkel used to, in a way, to employ um, uh, the, the backing of academia uh, for, for her measures. Wait a minute. Now I try the next one. The next one was an interesting uh, collective effort uh, by an, uh, a number of colleagues. Um, uh, we published a paper, Understanding the Effects of COVID-19 through a live course lens with Richard Satterson uh, in the lead. And again, here, we obviously could not report on any findings, but in a way suggested hypothesis why it would be important uh, to also look at, at life causes if we want to understand the effects of COVID-19. And, sorry, I have a problem here. Okay, and finally, together with Alexa Fernkranz, um, we published, uh, Leopoldina again, published a report on, on um, research for, for uh, the additional years, um, a report on aging and life course research. And there we decided in the final end to add um, some section on uh, the effects on COVID-19. So these were my, my three academic contagions, all at early in the stage and all more hypothetical than reporting on anything. So what is the analytical toolbox of sociology? Sociology deals with social action and social norms on the individual basis. It deals with social relations, social networks, social structure and social inequalities, life causes and social change, and the system perspective, namely about institution and subsistence. And there's also an important part on culture, knowledge, and science. And obviously there are at least two or three important intersections with demography, namely social structure and, and life causes, but also the social networks. What are the questions which arise from there about COVID-19? First of all, what are the conditions and the emergence and acceptance of social norms, namely those norms which are important in this context? What do we know about social networks? And what could we say and predict about the consequences for contacts and infections? And on then the big question is, is COVID-19 a leveler or driver of social inequalities? Then in regard to life causes, we would like to know what are the potential midterm and long-term effects on individual lives. And in regard in a systems perspective, we might ask about how have the relationships between markets, states and civil society changed uh, during the epidemic pandemic and how will it change probably even after the pandemic. There's also an old tradition in sociology about uh, 
uh, sociology of disasters and catastrophe, which actually addresses the questions, what are typical trajectories in, the, in how people deal with the pandemics? And finally, uh, there is always an issue about Emil Durkheim, is what we, what we observe here during the corona crisis, does it actually lead to social, more social anomie? Or does it lead to more uh, a more uh, strengthening uh, of collective identity? So I will uh, focus on especially life causes and inequalities. But just make a, a, a short remark on social norms, but because this is obviously extremely important, um, what sociology has to say about the likelihood that social norms uh, in regard to uh, uh, social distances, mask wearing, uh, will actually be observed uh, or not. And here, uh, the important distinction is the one between cooperation games and coordination games. Cooperation games are those where we benefit ourselves from something. And social distances was something like this. Therefore, it was accepted quite rapidly and adopted quite rapidly. In contrast to at least the initial rationale for mask, which meant we do something for others where we don't have an immediate benefit. And as we saw, this is a much more harder to, to uh, convince people to do this. There's also the issue about whether social action in, in the pandemic is really just only rational instrumental and has not also a very important expressive symbolic behavior, even if you don't really believe in the efficacy of masks, uh, it's still important that we wear it. The question about social networks, I don't have to say much because Nicolas Popper um, um, made actually a wonderful presentation on this. The surprising thing is that uh, there is very little prior knowledge about how the social networks in a society uh, look like and what the consequences are for contacts and infections. And I refer you to the review by Smith and Christakis uh, on this. Uh, this is actually something uh, Nicolas Popper showed as well. Uh, there is uh, uh, an early uh, a paper by Myers and others on the Vancouver outbreak of SARS, uh, which actually makes some, uh, shows us how uh, social networks uh, might look like. But I now come uh, to social inequalities and to claim that Corona is a great leveler. I refer here uh, to an interesting piece by the historian Adam Toos, a former colleague of Yale who is now at Columbia, who wrote in a piece in foreign policy, the sociologists who could save us from corona, coronavirus. This is a talk about Ulrich Beck. Ulrich Beck in his book of 1996 about risk society, at least according to Adam Toos, made the perfect prediction about what we observe in uh, now with the corona rising. It's an invisible risk. It's a risk as a collective inescapable fate. It goes beyond classes, regions, and nations. One cannot really make too much by one's own effort. And science has an ambiguous role of it. It's also, he was of course talking about man-made risks. And the question of course is, um, then it would not apply to Corona. But in fact, as you probably know, there's a big controversy that in fact, Corona is, a, is a, it's a consequence of what is called zoonose, namely impacts of men on the natural environment, which makes the outbreak more likely. Heinz Bude in a, a journal article, a newspaper article in April made a similar argument. Uh, we are all equally and collectively exposed to the risk and we are all equally subject to anti-pandemic measures. 
We also are equal in the fact that we now more than ever sub need support on others and compliance of others. And also we are all equal more or less vis-a-vis uh, -vis the health system. So we are all in the same boat. Uh, we have a collective responsibility for others and collectively we should accept state measures. But the main question is, is that of course, is that actually the case? And at least in the popular press and also in, in academic research, the major argument is no, there is, Corona is not the great leveler, but it actually has very inequalitarian outcomes. So let me find, okay. So when we talk about socioeconomic inequalities in our coronas, we should talk about risk groups. We should uh, have an idea about an inventory of, risk, of risks and then uh, multiply risk groups and risk types and talk about uh, vulnerabilities and resi resilience, accentuation and compensation of risk. And of course, have some idea about which dimensions of inequality we are actually talk about. Groups at risk are especially in this context of along two axes. One axis are socioeconomic inequalities. They can be distributive, relational, categorical, or they can be socio-demographic life situations like types of households, uh, uh, et cetera. As this, as this conference has made abundantly clear, we are talking about different kinds of risks. And the question is, what is the relationship of inequalities to this risk? Namely, the probability of social contacts, the probability of infection given contact, the probability of illness and severity of illness given infection, the probability of mortality and the probability of medium in long-term uh, physical organic effect, bodily effect of COVID-19. And finally, uh, the social and economic corona effects more generally uh, of public uh, policy. Now, it's actually interesting if you think about uh, the probability of social contact, there, are good arguments to argue that is actually the reverse uh, with social inequality. So in a way, before social distancing and lockdown measures, those people with social, higher socioeconomic resources have more contacts, they travel uh, more often, both in leisure and business. They probably have a higher degree of social integration and higher social support. But on the one hand, there might also be a social status related thinning. Just think of cars versus uh, public transport. After policy measure, that kind of change that actually people with small resources probably had the chance of putting constraints both on occupational and private contexts more so uh, than other people due to larger homes, due to home office uh, and, and other uh, kind of things. Uh, if you think of um, groups at risk, uh, just rem remind you that um, there's a lot of talk about nursing home, but as I read the literature, there's actually a correlation between social status and being a nursing home in Italy. Why? Because probably a wealthier uh, uh, people actually have uh, their Filipinas at home or are taken care of in multi-generational uh, family. A first glance we see here, a uh, uh, study by Chang and, and others on, on uh, US counties, after lockdown measures in the US, um, the, the top 10, uh, we are able much more to restrict uh, their spatial mobility than the bottom, bottom uh, 10% where the restricting actually uh, bounce, uh, bounce back. Uh, Chang also shows that low income groups 
seem to have extra household interactions with higher interaction uh, density, just think of fast food places uh, and the like. What we know little about, and um, uh, I know of no such table for, for the present corona, uh, about the um, differential probability of infection given uh, contact. This is also from the Vancouver study by a study by Myers and others where he first shows different likelihood uh, of infection and then also shows that actually as they are given infections, there are differential likelihoods uh, what happens uh, after uh, you de decrease uh, contact. So the likelihood of severity of illness and death, um, obviously that all depends on access to information, to medical practice, to tests and high quality uh, medical uh, treatment. And wait a minute. And wait, wait, sorry. And all this is, of course, the core of, of what is called social epidemiology. There, it's uh, highly standard uh, that uh, both social support and social relationships are protective mechanism, that there are very strong relationship between social inequality and uh, a number of chronic diseases. There is even, um, as shown in the vital study by Mahmoud, uh, even if, if income differences are small, there still remains differential uh, in, in uh, morbidity and mortality uh, due to occupational stress, which actually has been shown to be directly related to immune uh, strengths. There is also social spatial segregation and uh, toxic uh, exposure. Um, Marmo just has shown in a report for the UK, a reversal of trend of life expectancy in a way showing relating uh, macroeconomic changes, negative ones uh, to reversals of life expectancy. And, and the same has been shown in the new book by Case uh, in Deaton. Um, just to give one example uh, for the financial crisis, uh, it has been shown in an article in Lancet that one percent in Brazil, 1% unemployment led to half a percent higher unemployment rate. Coping with the, the uh, consequences of of COVID-19, um, there should be a, a lot of relationship to inequality, both related to social uh, isolation, to education opportunities and the digital divide, the loss of income, reverse the loss of wealth and clearly uh, unemployment. Both exposure uh, should be lower and potentials of coping should be the higher the highest the social, economic, and social cultural resources. What is the, the story about life causes? The story about life causes is there are pop potential negative long-term consequences if there are important life cause transitions which are impacted and cannot easily be delayed or compensated later. So the question is, are they important impairments of health, creating a trajectory of ill health in later life? What are the consequences of missed schooling? And we actually have shown in the German life history study, both for German unification and for the aftermath of World War II, that there, there can be major these major consequences of disruptions, especially if people uh, do not uh, enter apprenticeships and cannot uh, finish uh, their qualifications. Okay, now I come to a few selected findings. Again, I come to, wait, no. 
The first one is a study by uh, people from the Robert Koch Institute on socioeconomic inequality in the risk of infection with COVID-19. And they looked at uh, reported infections um, for uh, all uh, Kreise counties uh, in Germany. And what you see uh, to the left is that the, the light colors are the most advantageous uh, counties and the blue colors are the most decent econ economically disadvantageous counties. To the right, you see um, uh, standardized on the population, uh, you see the COVID-19 cases. And you almost see the complement uh, of, of what you see uh, to the left. So there seems to be, and that is shown here, an inverse relationship uh, between socioeconomic deprivations in, on the aggregate level of counties and, uh, and cases uh, of, of COVID-19. Uh, um, what is interesting, however, is that this finding is especially one for the beginning, and it might actually go back to these ideas about the status related need of social contacts. Uh, it actually almost washes out uh, if we go uh, into May uh, and, and June. There is a, a wonderful study by Dragano and others uh, using uh, uh, health insurance data of more than uh, 1 million uh, hospitalizations um, in, in Germany. And what you see here is the hospitalization rate for a number of, of, uh, uh, of economic, socioeconomic categories. So the employed are doing better, the so short term unemployed are doing worse. Uh, so those people on social assistance doesn't seem to matter much. And especially you see a big effect uh, of long-term employed. On the univariate analysis, uh, this becomes uh, much more obvious and you get a big effect of 84% uh, higher um, likelihood of hospitalization for long-term long unemployed even if you standardize uh, for age uh, and gender and also special benefit recipients clearly show uh, much higher rates of hospitalization. Okay. Um, now I look at um, social demographic risk factors on deaths and I'm using here a study on Sweden by Sven Trefal and others, including our good colleague uh, Gunnar uh, Andersson. And what is interesting here is that they show the hazard ratios for a number of socioeconomic categories, both uh, for deviations for all other causes of deaths and for COVID-19. And if you look at, uh, at men and civil status, you see there is not much difference between all other causes of this and COVID-19. Uh, on educational level, COVID-19 is a little bit higher in the middle uh, category. And um, there is not much difference for men uh, in regard to income categories. What is, however, striking is that for um, uh, people with migrant status, there's a huge effect uh, of COVID-19. It actually reverses uh, the effect from all other causes of death, which has been argued to have something to do with selective migration. But here we see um, that uh, people from migrant countries have a disproportionate uh, likelihood of uh, dying from COVID-19. For women, um, never married, divorced, widowed have a higher likelihood of contracting COVID-19 than dying. 
and uh, then from other causes of death. And you see uh, a similar uh, situation in regard to migration status. So sorry for the small interruption, five minutes. Still. Okay, so Trefal and others conclude that the interaction of the virus causes COVID-19 and its social environment exerts an unequal burden on the most disadvantaged uh, members of society. And in a way, the social predictability relates both to all causes of this and, um, and a higher risk of uh, COVID-19, but it's usually not uh, compounded. In regard to economic consequences, uh, I show you here some res result from uh, a study conducted by our Trade Union Research Institute, uh, the Distribution Report 2020. Here, what you see here are um, households in different, um, in, in different income categories. And uh, the lilac, uh, the violet color shows the relative proportion which suffered income losses, clearly but moderately uh, related uh, to uh, different incomes, uh, getting to the extreme uh, on in the lower household uh, income uh, brackets. If you now look whether these income are big uh, or small, again, there's a big correlation between uh, income, income, household income groups um, and as a relative uh, proportion, the relative importance, the relative size of economic losses. Uh, almost a very similar picture is shown uh, to those people uh, exposed to uh, shortening hours, reduction of, of uh, uh, working hours. Uh, you see a very clear relationship between uh, income levels, except for the uh, lowest income level. And that has uh, something to do that actually the uh, proportion employed in this category uh, is lower. I now come uh, to the second part, uh, the consequences uh, for life causes. And Ludger Westman, the economist from Munich, very early in the pandemic had a very nice paper in which he asked, uh, what are the likely effects of, uh, of the closing of schools uh, on uh, later uh, life income? And he looked for, for this, he looked at um, wage income, life wage income difference uh, between number of school years. He, he looked at uh, historical experience from the 60s where some German schools switched the school year from spring to fall and only had half a year uh, in the first grade. There's a big literature on the so-called summer gap in the United States and there is also some research on the consequences of teacher strikes. Westman comes to the conclusion that if one third of a school year is lost, like in spring, that will reduce labor income across the whole working lives by three to four percent. So a major uh, reduction of working life, uh, working life income. It's a real scarring. Uh, kind uh, of effect. We might question uh, his kind of reasoning because um, it's not really clear whether we can compare, use the data of number of school years because clearly say selectivity in regard to who has more and who has less uh, school, school years. We also might argue that actually uh, it's not, was not a spring gap but uh, there was actually instruction and therefore uh, the impact of schooling uh, might be, might be uh, smaller. Therefore, we actually need data on what actually happened uh, during this school time. Um, all the studies which have been shown show an important reduction, a massive reduction of learning time uh, during uh, uh, 
during this time. Uh, seven and a half hours uh, were cut to about a half, and low achievers even uh, was cut even more uh, than uh, for uh, higher achievers. Not that much, but it was uh, what is actually interesting, however, for our debate here. <clears throat> that the reduction in learning time was not larger for children for lower educated parents than for children for higher educated uh, parents. The only, the only difference is that they did different kinds of things uh, during their leisure times, uh, where, where the lower educated uh, uh, people with lower educated parents uh, played more computer games and uh, others uh, uh, did play their instruments or other kinds uh, uh, of things. It's also clear that uh, neither schools nor parents could uh, compensate uh, for if there was less support of low achieving students. So in this sense, it's clear that there are major effects. So we might believe the conclusion of first month but there is still some open the question whether this is uh, larger for people from higher status. Okay, that is the same uh, contract. So, so finally, still one, or, question, still one or two minutes, please. Okay, yeah. I'm, I am close. Now the question is, um, will there be a generation Corona? That is, will be, there be a generation with a be cohorts which will suffer um, throughout their life uh, from what, what happens now. And here, uh, we probably have to look especially at supply and demand for apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are crucial in this context because in Germany, there are still about, uh, uh, out of a cohort of 70 to 800,000, there are still about 500, 600,000 actually make an apprenticeship. The supply of apprenticeship has clearly been reduced by about 25 to 65 less than in the year 2019. Uh, about 100,000 uh, were in the summer, still did not have a contract. That is not unusual, but um, it's clearly more than it was uh, 2019. The German government actually uh, implemented a, a policy to help firms uh, to support apprenticeships, but actually uh, the money which firms get is fairly low. The pickup is low. In a study it was shown that actually only half of the firms even know uh, that uh, of that uh, program. Um, it's clear if we look at, at prior educational qualifications, it's clear that uh, people from the lower education grades, the Hauptschule graduates are heard most, but there's also in, um, uh, findings from the 2008 crisis, which might apply here again, that people who don't get an apprenticeship uh, actually stay in school and even uh, go to university uh, instead of uh, uh, going to an apprenticeship. Uh, this is just uh, a, a, a survey among personnel directors, which uh, basically show uh, that there will be in their perception about a quarter less training places. So if I sum up, in regard to probability of, of contact, there are, in a way, counterintuitive effects of social status. It might actually be the reverse. Uh, think of the so-called Ischgl effect. Um, in regard to the probability of infection, uh, uh, of, con of infection given a contact, um, it is um, unclear. And actually, uh, the social demographic groups might be more important. Um, but in a way, the mechanism and, and the, the, the linkage 
are the prior chronic diseases clearly at the higher vulnerability, clearly related uh, to socioeconomic status. Uh, we have shown that the long-term unemployed are especially hurt in regard to uh, hospitalization and, uh, and mortality we have not in, in Sweden, uh, we clearly have uh, high uh, effects. Household income is moderate, uh, uh, moderate to high. Actually, the predictions for worlds were that it would have been a big effect because all catastrophes like wars seem to have leveling effect in the distribution of wealth. Well, if we look at, uh, at uh, uh, in shares, income, um, uh, then uh, we know that, that uh, the tax and other indices are almost back where they were uh, from the beginning. In regard to life cause effects, um, loss school is, is, is somewhat uh, unclear. Um, entering apprenticeship, there might be a big effect and entering first time employed, there might be actually a benefit of our shrinking cohort sizes, which then um, in a way cancel, uh, might cancel the negative effect of reduced uh, offers of first-time employment. Open issues, <clears throat> all in all, probably social demographic uh, categories are probably more important because they are more directly related to both uh, social contexts and uh, exposure to risk. There are some indication that rather than overall changes in inequality, that exclusion uh, is important. Just think of the Swedish results on migration. Overall, I have a sense in the literature that there is some, in a way, an overemphasis on the crisis bias. Everybody expects major effects. It's still quite unclear whether they will come about or not. Uh, there is also probably a kind of a social justice effect that probably uh, bigger effects of inequality uh, in comparison to other categories uh, are expected. <clears throat> um, I see a lot of um, arguments about effect size, uh, about significant sort of effect size. And again, um, as Michaela Kreind uh, uh, noticed before, there are actually many low quality pre publication Final question, Emil Durkheim, and we had some wonderful results today already on, on divorce and, and, and breakup. Um, overall, I think the question is open, but overall, I think uh, there's probably on balance, a more strengthening of collective identity than social anomia. Thank you much.